This is House Planning Help, episode 216. Hello, I'm Ben Adam Smith, and this is the podcast for you if you're interested in self-build because I am exploring what houses we should be building in the 21st century and try to break down the major roadblocks that may get in our way. It's a good one today. I'm keen on saying it's a good one all the time, but it's a good one today. Mark Brinkley, author of the best-selling book, The House Builder's Bible, is my guest, and he's just moved in to his latest self-build. So I'm asking this question, does it get easier as a self-builder? Is it all rainbows and unicorns for Mr. Brinkley? We'll find out in a moment. I think I have reached a significant point in my self-build, and do you know why? It's because I've been asked this question more than once as I've bumped into various people. What are you going to do after you've finished your house? Perhaps this is to do with the photos that I've been posting online. It's starting to look like a finished house. We're approaching the second fix now. And really, it feels like we've gone over the crest of a wave. You have lots of decisions to make and it ebbs and flows a little bit. It reminds me of if you're working in a restaurant, if you've ever done this, I'm thinking back out to Australia when I was backpacking and I was working in a bar and you get the Friday or the Saturday rush when everyone would come in. You'd be pulled in all sorts of different directions. Where's my food? Back into the kitchen, back outside. And then suddenly you get on top of the situation and everything calms down again. It feels like one of those situations and quite exciting as well because this is all very surreal to think that we might actually be living here. We're actually going to live in this house soon. So there's definitely a discussion we need to have at some point as to where I go, because I have a few ideas. I can tell you what I'm not going to do, and that is to just build another house straight away, become a serial self-builder. The circumstances would have to be right. For example, I'd need to change location or we'd need money out of the house, whatever it might be. But I'd like to stay put if I possibly can for a few years. You know, We would like this to be our family home. We've tailored it for us. So we definitely need to have a think about what could come next because I'd like to do another construction project, but it's not going to be a self-build. Anyway, let's move on and meet our guest. He's someone who's been on the podcast a couple of times before. He always brings great value. I'm talking about Mark Brinkley, the author of The House Builder's Bible. What's interesting is this time we are discussing a self-build that he's completed. It's actually his second, although he has vast experience beyond that on other construction projects. And I thought that that might be a good place to start today to find out what did he get up to before the House Builders Bible was even an idea. I had an interesting path into construction in that I started bumping into friends who made a living out of building in the 1980s, early 80s, and uh, I thought they're more fun to hang out with than the people I was hanging out with. And I said to them, you got any work, basically? And they said, yeah, well, we like to try a bit of everything. And that was the beginning of the the Cambridge building cart, really. And uh, my very first job was doing up a house quite near here. And we we were sort of naturally green, although at the time... So the nascent green building movement was not really very well organised back then. And uh, we started doing up houses in and around Cambridge during the improvement grant boom, which has long since gone. But these terraced houses, we're sitting in a street of Victorian terraced houses at the moment, had only just passed the point of not being demolished for slum clearance and in the 60s that was the trend to take them all down and it suddenly occurred to people actually these are quite nice houses and it was on that sort of inflection point at the time the government started throwing money at people wanting to put in inside toilets and central heating and kitchens into houses and that's where we learned about building and there was a group of about 15 of us whittling down to about 10 which eventually whittled down to about seven that were going out and we did all the trades we did uh, the foundations, the drains, but no point listing the trays. There's nothing we didn't, the only one we didn't never try was plastering because everybody tried it once and said, nah, too hard. It's a really, really incredibly skillful trade to be a good plasterer. But everything else, we'd, you know, one day would be roofing, the next day would be wiring, they were doing a bit of plumbing, and I'm not sure it's actually even very high standards, but we, <laughs> we, we enjoyed it and people enjoyed employing us, and, you know, and, and we were certainly scrupulous about it. And gradually that sort of developed became more professional over the years and I split off with a guy called Robin and we started doing a business called Complete Fabrications and we thought we'd actually start doing developing and building new houses 
And in fact, I built a house with him down the end of this street, no more than 300 yards away in 1987, 1988. That was my background in building. And I went off and did a carpentry course. At the time, the government did what they called TOPS courses, which also went out the window in the 1980s when Thatcher got to grips with the wayward government largesse. But it was a six-month course, full-time, and you went through the whole gamut of what a carpenter would learn on an apprenticeship, and uh, they paid you to do it. I had to go drive up to Peterborough every day. But uh, it was really fascinating, and, uh, you know, that they'd even think of doing that. And So gradually we sort of upskilled and learnt more about the trades and learnt more about the management of it, and that was the sort of background in building. So very general... You know, rather than typical builders come up through a trade, don't they? Sort of apprentice, they do a trade, and then gradually they get into management. We came at a completely different angle of, we'll have a go at this and try it and see what happens. And uh, I, I guess we were sort of gifted amateurs, really. We probably weren't as good as builders as we thought we were, but it was certainly a good way of learning. When did you do something for yourself, a building that you were going to live in? Well, I had a house on the other side of, well, very near here, in fact, another Victorian street, about half a mile away. And uh, my dad died when I was only 27, and I inherited some money and and decided to spend it on doing a green eco-renovation. And we clad the walls with the polystyrene insulation outside. The veils were about, there's a couple called Robert and Brenda Vale, who... I see live you, in New I, Zealand, don't they? I see you nodding. Uh, they were, at the time, probably the leading lights of green architecture in, in, in the country, and they were had jobs here at the university. And we said, to, why not come and help us with this house design? They did a, a passive solar conservatory or with lots of flaps, and it was all very 19, 1980s. And people wouldn't dream of doing it now, but at the time it seemed cutting edge. And uh, we worked with Robert and Brenda... And we did a couple of other projects as well. So we sort of did this house up and it looked like nothing else. It still looks like nothing else. It's still there with all this, well, it's external insulation. And you do see quite a bit of it about, it was under the Green Deal, wasn't it? But it was an early version of it, an early iteration. <laughs> <laughs> and we were working out the details as we went along. So there's bloody great uh, bits missing where there's a boiler flue coming through. We could never work out how one of the stench pipes, how we get around there. We had to extend the roof and it was... It was a, it was a learning experience, but it was a fascinating, and um, you know we got a reputation for doing wacky buildings. And so, did you build your own home from scratch? Is that something you'd done before? No, I drifted in. Then, then I did a, a renovation on a, a Victorian terrace, which gutted it and completely pulled it apart. The first time, the only time I built a house from scratch was the one out in the countryside in in Western Colville, where which was the genesis of the House Builder's Bible. That would have been 1992, I think, 91, 92. And it was a response to uh, the Lawson bust when, when you know, when the, the, the housing market was in a desperate state. And Robin and I had been accumulating building plots, thinking we were going to become property developers. And suddenly no one wanted to buy a house, you know, for the love and the money. And uh, we had to go and live on one of our mistakes. And I said, well, I'll go on that one. And we had, <laughs> I had three small kids in a small terrace house and and we needed more space. So it was a go out there and 45 grand that plot cost. Wow. It seemed expensive at the time. <laughs> they uh, always do, don't they? It makes you worried about tomorrow. And um, we built the house. There, and, and that was the process. That, and, and being the client, which I guess is what you're experiencing at the moment, you suddenly realised what a big job being the client is, you know, and all this decision-making is phenomenally taxing. And there was no guidance on it, really. There's lots of textbooks on how to build a house, and there was very little on what you should put into a house and, you know, what what makes a good house. And I thought, well, that's... That's a gap in the market. That's uh, I probably told you all this before in previous talks. I'm no not doubt, sure you have actually. <laughs> I, I don't think we've ever touched on this. We, but or if we have, exactly we haven't what, had the background that we've had yeah. today. And my next question is well, really: your experience sort of changed, won't it? Yeah, yeah, and, definitely. And, and it's interesting revisiting it. Here we are, 25 years later, and I, I, I hadn't built 
anything. I've done odd bits of building work for people immediately after that in the in the in the nineties, and then I separated from Robin completely and just started doing nothing but writing, as the book sort of became more successful. And I've spent years going around, you know, interviewing people and visiting businesses and all this, looking at houses. But actually, doing the process, I'd forgotten what a lot of hard work it is, isn't it? And, and how taxing it is. Even, even, you know, with this whole lifetime's worth of knowledge about what you can and can't put in a house. It hasn't changed, it though, change. in and terms of what goes on. You just, as you say, you forget what it means. It's more complicated, for sure. The, 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 just the range of options is phenomenally larger than it was back in the 90s. I suppose it makes it harder, is, doesn't it? But also, the you know, having to tax yourself and questions of budget, questions of taste, questions of functionality... You know, what sort of light switches do we want? We've been going through that for the last couple of months. You know. I'd have a light switch, please. You know. Oh, no, no, there's there's 35 different kinds of light switches you can choose. You know. Oh, Christ, here we go again. You know. And you actually get sort of fatigued by these sort of ridiculous decisions you've got to make. You know, well, actually, what you want is a functioning house. And Do you find any part of it easier or tougher where have you felt drained because for me as a client i've gone through this and there have been times where the decisions come thick and fast but i think going down the contractor route with architect and having interior designer this is how i wanted it just a good experience for the first time um well what's been harder has been coming to grips with the wealth of choices out there we deliberately chose mole as an architect because we knew they'd push the boat out and do something a bit different. So there's been lots of products like metal roofing, for instance, which I'd never worked with before, uh, which is a whole... whole so did, were game. you wanting to experiment with it? I think yeah, this is yeah. this is very yeah. much the part of the self-builder, isn't it, if you yeah. do it more than once? And and uh, and, the, the, and the curious um, louvered cedar cladding that we have on the outside, which everybody comments on, which is like almost like the signature of the building, the, 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 what is it, you know? And, and I said, well, I don't know. I've never, you know, we had to work it out on site with the carpenters with sawtooth battens. And, and we've got some great tradesmen. Funny enough, quite a few of them are children of people I knew, you know, when I started building in the 80s and and really knocked out by how enthusiastic they all are and how competent they all are. Because there was always talk about building as an old man's game and the younger generation don't want to get their hands dirty and everything blown my preconceptions away you know they're really incredibly into it and it's been a joy to work with them really we can pass on bits of information but we learn at least as much from them as they learn from us and and they like a challenge everybody likes a challenge you know so they're really engaged in doing things differently and, and working ways out, out, out of doing it so that's been a delight really the, the people we've been working with but the pressure is on to keep feeding the goat you know i'm paying most of these guys on a day rate so if I mess around and can't make a mind up, then uh, the buck stops right in, in, in our bank account. So, How yeah. are you procuring this whole build? Um, I'm acting as the builder. I have a, a service company that, that has accounts with the various builders' merchants and also reclaims the VAT on a, on a quarterly basis. I'm not going down the DIY self-build route. I'm basically working with the architect's plans but hiring well if it's a big subcontractor like the roofing we'll put it out to competitive tender but an awful lot of it is actually finding someone who can do it you know so it's searching around who can do metal fabrication or bits and pieces and building a relationship with them and uh, negotiating usually on a price occasionally on a day rate sometimes sometimes the job is so fiddly that it's quicker to work on a day rate and i would never ever felt by anybody that I've been ripped off by doing day rate because they've all done their day's work and, you know, often more. You know, they often do nine or ten hours' work and charge me for eight. And You'll get their dads to tell them off. No, <laughs> they're, they're um, you know, there's, a, there's a, a, a pride in it. Almost, it's almost irrelevant, you know. It's troublous if you do it on a price, you could end up arguing about the extras, you know, this change, that change, you know, whereas I want the freedom to sort of come in and... How does that and, uh, help you in budgeting, well, I've got a grand budget for the whole thing. I, I watch it like a hawk. I keep timesheets. I keep tabs on it. I've got a spreadsheet that's now got to about 500 and nearly 600 lines of data on it. We're a little bit over budget, a little bit over time. It's pretty much if you're on if you're on time, you're on budget. That's the old saying, isn't it? It's pretty true. Uh, you, I like to overspend, and we're probably, I think, about 5% overspend, something like that, which is 
I'm happy with. We're in the contingency, Sam. You're doing better than us, then. <laughs> I think... Um, Start with well, a generous budget. That's a, that's, that's well, a tip. I, I've also seen lots of people <laughs> go over budget. So, and no, it was our choice. We could have value engineered further. So, well, I, I, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because you think, you know, if you value engineered too much, you might as well just have bought a developer's house, you know, because there's a world of difference between a, a developer's box and, and, and going out and trying something a bit different and... and and I think that's the hardest thing when you create a dream it's and then you, you then think, well, actually, no, you can't have that anymore. <laughs> Change this, do that. But That's absolutely true. It's, it, it's so difficult to do that because, you know, as you say, you go to the, the self-build shows and you sort of see all the, the wares on display and you walk around and think, oh, I have that, I have that, you know, and you think, well, actually, do you really need them? You know, what, 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 you know, how much of this stuff do you actually need and how much do you want and what do you need to create a beautiful house? And, they're difficult questions. They're, you know, you've got to approach that from a not not just a budget, but from a sort of personal point of view. Why are you doing this in the first place? You know, and, and it's obviously a lot of people want to do it because, for instance, this plot had I think thirty, forty people chasing it in the week it was on the market. You know, I guarantee no one was going to make any money out of it because it was just going to be. You know, this was not a money making venture because it was so many people were chasing it. So it was in a way. Only people really interested in building were going to get involved in something like this. We talked about this last time, the plot. Maybe you could just do the quick recap so we can talk about how you've moved on with the designs and then building it. Well, the design process was... I found that quite taxing, I must admit, because we went through three or four iterations and started bouncing them around with the the planners and the conservation officer and, you know, and it sort of took on a life of its own almost. Suddenly we came up and said, well, that looks all right. Yeah, it's quite fancy that, yeah. But without really knowing what we were building in, in terms of amenity, was, a lot of it was done from the sort of street eye view. Would, would it add to the, you know, the, 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 would it look good on the street? Would it look boring? Or would it, so, you know, would we, we, we were looking at a wow factor, I suppose. And actually, that's incredibly difficult to do from a, from a set of plans, you know, because you, can, you can't really work out what the effect's going to be. And then and then we tweaked it after planning. We made one or two little changes uh, to, to make the house more functional. And then since then, we've had full architecture package, you know, about 80 drawings. And when it first arrived on my lap, I thought, completely over the top, we'll never use We've used every one of them, you know, been referred to it. So the service has been great. And um, How far did you take that as well in terms of the architect? Well, we're full architect's package. We, we, we're not using a, a warranty on it. We're, just, we're using architect's certificates, which I'm hoping we'll get, but we have to pass building regs at the end. And we work with the architects. They norm the standard routine of them to come every two weeks, but in fact they've been doing probably slightly less than that because I've been so involved in it and they know I know a bit about building anyway. So a lot of the details we're working out together, you know, and they're coming across, you know, the whole process of problem solving and, and uh, overcoming issues is common to people. In, you know, if people are interested in building, they'll, they'll, they'll do it, whether they're an architect or builder or a client, you know, you sit down, you thrash it out. And that sort of level of working, cooperative, communicative working has worked very well on this this job. I and mean, there's been one, one, two little glitches and we said, well, let's get together and try and solve it. And uh, it's been the way I suppose I wanted to work. It didn't really have a plan of that's how we do it at the beginning, but that's how it's happened. And I've I've sourced all the subcontractors, and we've only really had issues once or twice, and that's to do with timekeeping, really. The standards have been basically fine. Somebody's getting busy, you know, and, and saying they'll be there next week and they're there the week after. That sort of stuff has been quite common. And that's really why we're, we're running a bit late. Yeah, it's still very busy, you know. It's probably seen in Cambridge is still very hot, you know. Although it seems to have been cooled down in London a bit, isn't it? But all the reports of this town is everyone's got booked up for months in advance. So we're quite lucky to get hold of good subbies, I think. And the whole thing becomes a sort of process of you get down in the morning yourself. It's not as formalised as having a site meeting every morning, but you chat through the work ahead and what you need. And I, I quite often go out and get the materials, like the formica that. Will is doing at the moment in the garden. We were sort of looking at worktops in the utility room. And we didn't want a big chunk of chipboard from B and Q. Bless B and Q. Nothing against B and Q. I've been quite a bit from B and Q recently. But he was saying, "Well, I'm doing 
four mica worktops in my bathroom at the moment. And we've got this you know, lovely old 1950s technique with plywood put on four mica, and you can get lovely shades of blue. And said, so we'll go for it, and we're looking for that edge. So I do a fair amount of running around looking for old materials, just keeping the site sweet, really, and, and, and a phenomenal amount of clearing up. <laughs> People, there always is. I always said the... Uh, the um, See, sometimes I don't think it gets cleared up straight away, does it? It accumulates. And well, one of the old saying is, is um, you know, it's the biggest shopping trip of your life. It's also the biggest cleaning session of your life because this is a tight site with no space around it. All the materials have to be either in the garden or in the house. And if you suddenly, you know, you want to work in one room, it means moving everything out of that room somewhere else. So constantly stuff is shifting around the house. But forever losing, you know, dustpans and paint pots and ladders and, you know... So it's, so we probably lose, I don't know, an hour a day each trying to work out where the hell that paint pot's going, you know, that sort of stuff. And people just wandering, going, where have you seen, you know, it's happened three times a day, you know, where, where, where's that box of screws that was outside this morning? Don't know, you know, so the hunt is on for the box of screws, you know. And I guess if you were uber-organised, you might be able to overcome that. I, I, I'm, I'm actually not. I'm, I think on a project management scale, the... Um, if, if, if 100% was, you know, the super project manager never got anything wrong and 0% was absolutely hopeless, I think I'd probably be in the 60s or 70s. I'm not bad, but you can see where the, you know, the stress comes and the wheels start falling off. <laughs> Do you like to have the decisions coming quite close so you can see them or are you working way ahead of yourself? Well, we work, you know, we did a huge amount of pre-planning of decisions on... You know, but an awful lot of this has been swept aside. You know, you actually get to the point. You, both Mandy and I are terrible prevaricators. You know, we, think we can do this, we can do that, and we'll think about it. And we actually put it off till the day before it's needed, and then go and do it. That's that's the one to go for. And I think we're probably quite typical in that respect, because actually it's an education process. You know, you don't know really what you want as a work type. You know what you don't like. You know what you do like. You know, you don't want to buy more decton or quartz in the utility room that obviously you don't want a slab of of, of laminate you know so well, what are you going to go for he says playing around and suddenly a, a solution jumps at you and it's actually what the our carpenter's been using at home is that that sounds great and we've got exactly the same color so it's almost like it's sort of rolled at you like like chance as here on and like timber we've used a lot of oak in this house a lot of cedar a lot of Douglas fir, and they're sort of three. Well, they're all beautiful timbers, but we tried on, decided on the the big living room ceiling. We decided, well, how are we going to finish that? And originally, the architects had just drawn a plain plastered ceiling. We thought, well, we want some something a bit more exciting. We thought, how about Douglas fir with some lime wash, the sort of thing you might see in in, in the tropics? And it just happened that we've got a really good wood supplier out in Bottisham who does all sorts of interesting, wonderful timbers. And he said, yeah, I'll get you to plank it up and I'll make it this size. And we found methods of getting... We experimented on how we're going to get the finish and we had two coats of Osmo. And then how we're going to fix it, we worked it out on site and suddenly it looks right. And then all of a sudden we had about 40 extra metres of Douglas fir. So we've been looking for other places to use it. So we've done slatted shelves in the area and cupboard. We've been building this Douglas fir, just using it. And this morning we were putting cedar on the underneath of the cantilever, which you're sitting on. So you got for a cantilever. Now, whose idea was this? Well, that comes from from the architect, from the original design. The, the original building wasn't cantilevered. It was much the same footprint as this, but uh, we wanted a bit more presence on the stream. We also wanted, quite simply, some of the park bikes underneath without getting soaking. So, it was, <laughs> you know, you can have your own bike rack under there. Well, it won't be a rack, but there'll be a couple of hooks, you know. This is Cambridge. This is Cambridge, and bikes are important. So a cantilever just seemed like a, a, a nice solution to a to way of doing it. it. You know, steps the house out. So the form isn't simple. Is that through your design philosophy, or maybe you could explain a little bit about Well, it? the cantilever is simply to do with, well, other than the functionality of having a roof over your bike, it's mostly to do with the look on the street the, a lot of the rest of the form is actually to cope with 
not taking light from the neighbours because there are a lot of neighbours around here. That's your constraint, really, isn't yeah. it? Long, thin garden, backing yeah. onto gardens and houses. Yeah. And so we've got lots of obscured glazing on on one side and, and stepped profile on, on on the other side. And although actually the old warehouse was just an oblong box with a pitched roof, and we've covered the same footprint, but we're a little bit higher, and that's made the form we, we probably would have had a pitched roof we've ended up with a flattened roof because the uh, neighbors on that side said they couldn't see the chimneys of the, of the house on the other side uh so we flattened the roof you know and that's that was bloody complicated but you know it wasn't a deliberate decision to have a complicated form i mean i think naturally i wouldn't because well it sounds like that has come through it's planning really isn't it and um consideration all those things well it just evolved I mean, yeah it's interesting the whole design process sort of evolved as a way of starting up with an idea of making an interesting looking building and then slicing bits off here and there, <laughs> moving bits around just to keep the the, the, the neighbors happy which we had to do you know you, you can't come and chuck a house up and kill their view or their enjoyment so um yeah it's it's an evolution i think uh, we didn't quite know we'd st- set up with a building like that when we bought it we just thought let's do something let's build a house you know and without any particular idea of what it would look like and that evolved and the, the, the first, there's one or two iterations of it looked very very different there was a sort of thing that like a, a ziggurat with great big steps in it and Looked like something out of uh, Arabia, and that didn't really go down terribly well. It probably was not a good idea. <laughs> what else were you looking to have in this house, your second self-build? Well, um, in terms of features... Um, or guiding philosophy, whatever yeah, you... Well, t- to keep it fairly simple, to, to be energy efficient. We weren't going to have solar panels on the roof, funny enough. And then I was sort of persuaded. I wasn't persuaded. It was our own decision that you know, because it was it was only costing six grand to put them on, and actually it was far more. It was made far more sense to do that than packing even more insulation, having even smaller rooms. So, so we've got this interesting system, and in we have a plant room with the masses of gubbins in there, of which I'm still getting to grips with what the hell is what and what what it works. There's a gas boiler in there, but it's it's really only there as a backup. Yeah, hopefully. It will be off most of the time. Uh, and uh, we hope to get the hot water out of the, the, the PV on the roof. And um, we will see how it works. It's interesting, you know, we've just sort of turn, only turned it on yesterday. And of course, we're in the middle of a, what for us is a heat wave. So it's very hard. So we're generating electricity, but we've got no demand. So who knows? You've got to be in it for a year to have a clue really what it's going to be like, isn't it? And, uh, but you just moved in, haven't you? We moved in, Sunday was our first night in here. The removal van came a week ago uh, and we've still got a living room, kitchen area covered in boxes and furniture and we have no idea where it's all going. So it's, And we've still got all the Antinox protective coverings on all the floors. So it's not really terribly homely yet, but uh, that's my experience of, of, of building projects. You, that's how it happens. You know, you, Most people move in too early. Very rarely do you completely finish. I'm not sure anyone ever completely finishes this. I'd like it to be as finished as humanly possible, but be, you could be well be right. It'd be great because um, it's not great living on a building site. It actually slows the builders up as well. You know, they're even, even more moving and faffing about. So, it, you know, if you can leave it as long as possible. But yeah, things mount up, do. don't they? Rent on a. Funny enough, rent. we had a couple of break ins on this site quite early stages one bloke came and when he was still at the groundworks level and he crawled under the Harris fencing and helped himself to some tools and then some lad came in November and uh, jemmied open the, the window on the studio and stole my Makita drill set you know so it's funny it made me very anxious you know because we're only a living 50 minute bike ride away but every night I think oh I want to get there first thing in the morning make sure the site's all right you know so you don't feel about your own you know if you're living in a house and you go off for the day or go on holiday you don't think every day oh my god there'll be a break in but psychologically I was very keen to get in to stop that sort of trauma of oh my god they're going to break into our house so that was interesting funny enough they both got caught well that's good (laughs) hopefully that discourages them 
one by a CCTV camera that we set up. Nice. And, and the other one, um, we've got one of these surveyors collapsible ladders, you know these things? I'll give you a demonstration okay, afterwards. Right. Right? Anyway, uh, uh, but you, know, you can raise it up and down, and uh, he nicked that. And um, we told the police, and they said, we just found this place. We've never had a collapsible surveyor's ladder in here before. So I said, is that yours? So I said, yeah, yeah that's, that's our surveyor. So we got the bloke, you know. So Wow. But um, I guess maybe part of the fun of an urban self-build, because, you know, it's, it's, it's Romsey's not posh area, so it's, uh, you know, there's all sorts of things going on around here. This was your chance, though, wasn't it? You said to me that you just don't get these opportunities in Cambridge. You're very close to the centre. Yeah, and it's been... and uh, uh, The whole thing about being an urban build, you know, is, is interesting itself, because it brings a whole different issues like with traffic management and you know, getting skips in and out and cranes in and out and deliveries blocking roads and uh, i never thought today when i was coming here that you'd, you'd have a skip picked up outside and huge excitement <laughs> maybe not <laughs> it's well, it was excitement for me and then yeah. uh, seeing everything that's still going on outside um what have you learned then from this project you well, said in the setup that you probably know more than anyone. It's putting all that back into practice and then coming out the other side again. Well, I think I learned how little I know, actually. It's, it's, it's all... Um, that's, that's, that's not true. I mean, I do know a lot about it, but uh, without having been doing it continuing for 20 years, you get a very different perspective, you know, sort of commenting on it and writing it and interviewing people. There's nothing quite like doing it to sort of realise you, 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 the cutting edge and also finding out where the bounds of your knowledge are, how much you know, how much you don't know. And it sounds a cliche, but, you know, it's a hell of a lot of work. I, I kept a site diary. I tag everybody else's eyes. I don't tag my own. <laughs> but if I did... That would have been interesting. If I did, I mean, because the thing is, it's some, some of it's done at three o'clock in the morning on many many a sleepless night. You know, how, how do you how do you log that? And, an awful lot of time is just spent cleaning up and tidying up and how do you log that but I, it must are you working at the moment doing any work or is it all on here i i still am contributing odd articles monthly article or so but that's it I've, I've just thrown my time at this project for the last 18 months and uh, are you uh, looking forward to the end yes i am yeah because <laughs> it's all very personal as well that's the other thing that you perhaps forget when it's a long time ago that you built your own house there are, it impacts on you on your weekends on hobbies everything it really does it takes your life over and uh and particularly keen when you're when you're employing people on, on a day rate and uh, some days we're spending over a, th- a grand a day on on, on labor you know i think you don't you want to be there to make sure it's spent properly don't you and, and so uh it's amazing that it's such a popular thing for people to do now and it's become very fashionable isn't it i know lots of people think oh i'd love to build a house blah, blah, blah. They think, really <laughs> i think i'm nuts uh, but i mean I, i've ridden the the back of it with with, with my writing i'm not you know I'm, I'm, i suppose i'm partly responsible for it and uh but uh i do it's still a fraction of people that actually make it happen each year it is it's it is it's a tiny number of people isn't it and we're both on that count this year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in, indeed, right in the middle of it. And, and uh, yeah, what else do you do? I'm, I'm heading into my retirement years, you know, what do I do? So what does this book, mean book, book for the... cruise in the Mediterranean? I, I don't think myself doing that somehow. Is the House Builders Bible, have we got a few more updates and how might you change it, adapt it, any ideas for it? Well, I suppose in the back of my head I'm making notes and notes and notes and notes. And there will be a, a, another edition, and I have no idea quite how it's going to be different. Interesting enough, we've started using Notes, you know, iPhone's Notes facility, which is sort of like a flat database with that out any structure to it, isn't it? But I'm starting with masses and masses of notes. We've got about 300 notes there, and that's, that'll probably <laughs> end up feeding into a, oh, well, that's what happened there, you know, and, and that's what happened there. Because it, the stuff comes in fast and furious and often at random. You suddenly, and every day you learn something new. And the question is, how the hell do you structure that into, a, in, in, into some sort of shape that people can feed off and, and, and learn from? And I've learned, you know, massive, massive stuff on this job that I n- never knew before. Building's actually changed quite a lot in 25 years. It's a lot more red tape. The planning process is 
much more uh, time consuming and the planning conditions, you know, meeting planning conditions, there were very few back in the 90s. It was just starting back then. And now every job comes riddled with planning conditions and that was an eye opener. The actual process of building, I don't think it's changed at all. It's probably not been changed since Victorian times, you know, the, the way people get stuck into it and solve problems when it's going well. So there'll be more sections on red tape, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a sales line if ever I've heard one. Yeah. We'll be queuing at the bookshop. Mark, always a pleasure to catch up. I'm sure we've got uh, much more to discuss another time, but All thank right. you for having a chat now. Okay, good luck with the rest of yours. Get more in today's show notes, which are at houseplanninghelp.com slash 216, where you can review the main information once again in our summary. Also, check out some photos of Mark's new house. If you've got a comment or you'd like to ask a question, then scroll down to the bottom. That's the place to do that. Or actually tap us up on social media. I'll link to Mark on Twitter and also show you where to buy the House Builders Bible. And personally, I think we should make it a law that no one, particularly first timers, are allowed to start their self-build without having read this book first. Houseplanninghelp.com slash 216. Let's finish on a hub update. And this is my membership community for people who want to build eco homes. Mainly we're focusing on the UK, but we do have international members. What we're trying to do is steer you through what is tough. It will have taken me six years if everything does actually get finished off when we hope it will. Six years. So can I save you any time? Well, I hope so. That's what we're building up. Digital resources. It's about information. It's about support. There's a thriving community as well and a level of entertainment because I enjoy putting some of these videos together. Yes, there's information in it, but we want to try and make this fun too. So let's tell you about some new stuff that's gone into the harp. Our in-depth video case studies. We're pretty much wrapping up at Buckinghamshire Passive House, then either going on to my own build or back to Long Barrow where there's some action taking place. So this one is about plastering internally, and we got an interview with Mark Bennett in this current episode from Buckinghamshire Passive House. I think also we look at the brick slips because there are a number of different layers. Although you can render directly onto the fibre board, there are a few layers that need to be built up for the brick slips. There's a new course on developing house designs. What is it all about this stage of the process? How can you get yourself better prepared? Check out that. And we vowed to have more guests on our progress calls. So this month it's Adam Dadabai from Luft MVHR. Looking forward to that chat. If you're not a member, find out how to become one. Houseplanninghelp.com slash join. There we go. We're done. Thank you for being with me today. The House Planning Help podcast is produced by Regen Media, content that matters.